Good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming out in such uh, dreary weather. But I'm glad you're here for the inaugural event of the 2020 season for the Arkansas Humanities Center. Our discussion contextualizing coronavirus with a panel of experts. I'm going to introduce each of our speakers in turn. And then at the end, we will be taking questions. You'll notice at the end of several of the rows, there are white pieces of paper. Because we are videoing this event and because of the audio issues, if you have questions, I ask that you write those down and I will collect those at the end and then distribute those to our speakers so that they have a chance for me to say them out loud in a way that will be caught by the audio and that you could all hear them in the audience as well. So that's how our questioning is going to work. I'm very thankful to Professor Hammond who came to me with this idea of putting together a panel. I'll introduce Professor Hammond in a bit, but she is our China history <coughs> expert, and she thought that this would be a very important way to allay a lot of the fear that we're seeing in the community, and also to combat a lot of the stigmatizing that often comes alongside pan epidemics and epidemic disease. Um, our first two speakers are both from the Pat Walker Health Center. The first is Lynn Eddington, who has 42 years of nursing experience, 35 of those in college health. She is certified in telephone nursing practice, but also experienced in hospital nursing, in medical, surgical, pulmonary, postpartum, and newborn wards. She has been, since 2003, the director of nursing at Pat Walker Health Center, and in 2008 was voted one of Northwest Arkansas's best nurses. So you have that on campus to take care of you. Alongside her is Dr. Huda Sharaf, who has her MD from UAMS, her residency at Wash U, and after serving at Wash U as a clinical instructor in emergency medicine and a physician at Wash U's Student Health Center, she came and joined the University of Arkansas Health Center as director in 2008. She is also, here in Gerhardt Hall, a UARC Honors graduate. You can go up into the Fulbright College Honors Office and see her honors thesis, which I will not even begin to explain, but that when she completed a few years back. <laughs> and so she is one of our own, and I hope that you will give both of them a very warm welcome. Thank you very much for that introduction. I greatly appreciate it. Lynn and I are really used to doing talks together. I'm honored to have her with me, and I really do appreciate everyone being here tonight. Um, it's nice to see a lot of students in the audience. So what we're being tasked with, Lynn and I, is to talk a little bit about maybe some of the boring science stuff, and then a little bit more about clinical symptoms. And I tell you what, this presentation has probably been updated half a dozen times this week because of all the numbers that are changing daily. And so we did our best. So all this information data is pretty much up to date as of noon today. So if there have been any changes since then, it's not in the PowerPoint, but we'll hopefully verbally update those statistics. Um, just like um, our, our, our introductions basically said, we're, we're gonna try to get through this and then have each person actually present. And at the end of this session, hopefully have time for questions from the audience. So. All right, we'll get started on coronavirus. So coronavirus has been around for a long time. I mean, it's an important human and animal pathogen. My husband's a veterinarian, so he told me a little bit of information about coronavirus and cats. So um, again, the boring stuff is large, enveloped, positive strain <laughs> RNA virus. It's been pretty much felt to be kind of this innocent virus. It's inconsequential. For decades, that coronavirus actually causes the common cold. And it really wasn't until the 21st century when we started seeing new coronaviruses that were more pathogenic, like SARS and MERS. And so that's when those types of viruses started to evolve and we started seeing issues with transmission worldwide. But just keep in mind, coronaviruses have been around for a very, very long time. So, starting with the coronavirus issues that have started in December. So, in December this, of last year, another pathogenic coronavirus, so it's um, the Novel Coronavirus 2019. Um, you might hear it called the Wuhan virus, coronavirus. 
And it's since, the, since that initial identification in December, it's gone on to cause some significant illness and deaths now affecting multiple countries across the world. The ultimate scope of this, again, like I said, Lynn and I have been updating these slides for the last several days, and it continues. We apologize in advance if folks have questions and we really don't know the answers to them because frankly, the CDC doesn't know yet. And so they're still working on it. January 30th, um, basically the end of January, the WHO declared it a PHEIC. I saw that abbreviation for the first time, went back and said, Public Health Emergency of International Concern. It has not yet been declared a pandemic. We'll discuss that a little bit later on in our slides of what we have to have in order for the WHO or the CDC to declare it such. The WHO, who. the World Health Organization is the WHO. Thank you, Lynn. World Health Organization. So um, the World Health Organization today stated that, that, that basically the corona outbreak has uh, spread from China but does not yet constitute a pandemic. So Lynn and I decided to define what's the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic. An epidemic basically is what we see with seasonal influenza each year. You, basically, you see a sudden increase in the number of cases in a, in a certain population. A pandemic is basically spreads over several countries. It's worldwide, large numbers. The one example that I actually listed was a Spanish flu in 1918. Hundreds of millions of people were infected across the globe. More recent than that, we had a pandemic in 2009, and that was the swine flu. You know, keep in mind, you know, when you go back, when you look at the 1918 numbers, they're horrific. But they're horrific because, again, this is prior to a flu vaccine. This is prior to antibiotics, prior to modern medicine. So the number of deaths were just staggering in 1918. But keep in mind, you know, the swine flu in 2009 was also categorized as a pandemic. But you have to have certain criteria, and the coronavirus has not met that yet. Hopefully it won't, but the days to come will, will show us. Oh, buddy, I'm so sorry. It's 1918. Our slide's wrong. Sorry. That's, in case anyone mentions it, it's 1918 Spanish flu. Sorry. All right, so clinical symptoms. This is very, this is very important for folks to recognize. Um, this is when the history becomes very important. The symptoms for coronavirus are fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Unfortunately, that mimics a lot of other things. It can mimic the influenza, it mimics pneumonia, other types of lung infections. So this becomes critical for the medical provider to take a detailed history and obviously recognize any possible exposure risk. The incubation period is defined as a time of exposure to the virus to the time that a person develops symptoms. Initially, just two weeks ago, they thought the incubation period was 14 days. That changed last week. Now the range is anywhere between two to 14 days, with an average being five days. So that's quite a range. They're pretty firm on the fact that they don't think it's past a 14-day period. So when you're hearing in the news about folks being asked to self-isolate for 14 days or being quarantined for 14 days, that's where this number is coming from. Um, many of the reported infections are not severe, thankfully, but 15% of those patients have had critical illness, some being fatal. And again, with just, I mean, I'll reference back to influenza because we're also in the middle of that season as well. But just keep in mind that likely the folks that have died from coronavirus were probably those that had multiple chronic medical conditions, maybe were immunocompromised, had a weak immune system in some way. And that's the same that can be said with folks that actually die from influenza. All right, so testing for the coronavirus. You know, we're already getting a few calls at Pat Walker Health Center asking for <laughs> testing. Testing is only being done by the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia. What they're testing is they're testing <coughs> sputum, not to, mean, not to be too gross, but it's basically what you cough up. Um, they're also testing serum, your blood as well, and also doing nose swabs and oral swabs. But again, it's only being done through the CDC. We work closely with our Arkansas Department of Health, and what we would do is if, in fact, we were faced with this situation, 
would immediately isolate the individual, contact our health department, and they would help facilitate testing for the patient. Right now, the testing, because it has to travel, so that takes hours, is a roughly, at the very least, it's gonna be a day to a day and a half before results are known of a, a person under inspection, for, uh, under suspicion for possible. PUIs, yes, PUIs, under persons under investigation for coronavirus. You'll see that a lot in the news as well. Um, other things, so important things, like I said, when someone presents to you, you know, the first thing you probably need to do is also make sure they don't have influenza, since uh, again, that's common, and we'll go through those numbers as well, just to get a little bit of perspective regarding how the coronavirus is actually comparing to influenza numbers across our country. Um, chest x-rays can sometimes also show um, pneumonia on film. Um, not always, but that's one of the most significant complications of coronavirus as well as influenza. Treatment is supportive care. So what does that mean? Supportive care basically means that you're just trying to take care of the symptoms. If they have a fever, you wanna give them Tylenol or ibuprofen to lower their fever. If they're coughing, you wanna give them anti-cough medication. It is a virus. Antibiotics do not treat viruses. I still hear this, unfortunately, too often. And so that just needs to be very clear. There is no magic drug for coronavirus. We don't have an antiviral for it like we do with influenza. If people are dehydrated from fever or diarrhea or vomiting, they need to be given intravenous fluids or be pushed to be drinking more fluids throughout their day. But it's a support, it's, the treatment is to support that individual until the virus clears. And that also has yet to be determined at this point. Also, one other thing, steroids. You know, every year we get questions about wanting steroid shots for this or for that. Steroids weaken your immune system. So there is no purpose for steroids in the treatment of a viral illness as an outpatient. And that means not in the hospital. So if you have someone that's hospitalized, has infection everywhere, their lungs, their blood, that's called sepsis. There may be a role for steroids with that. For, but for just traditional clinic care, steroids are likely going to hurt a person not help them if they have an acute infection with this virus. Also, if a chest x-ray looks like pneumonia, well, this may be pneumonia. I mean, with both influenza and coronavirus, you can develop what's called a secondary infection, where you can get significant bacterial infections in the lungs. So if you see that, you need to treat the patient for pneumonia. Bacterial pneumonia is treated with antibiotics. Viruses are not. Interrupt me anytime, Lynn. So, um, <laughs> prevention. Um, I put exclamation, frequent hand washing. So a lot of this is common sense, but you know, Lynn and I always reiterate this over and over again, especially, we'll talk about vaping in just a couple of minutes. So frequent hand washing. Um, cough in your elbow. You know, my kids are always like Dracula cough. Don't cough in your hands, touch your doorknob, touch a keyboard, don't do that, cough in your elbow. Uh, when blowing your nose, coughing in a tissue, please throw it away immediately. Do not leave it on a desk. Do not leave it on a table. Um, folks don't really want your snotty rags. So um, avoid sharing kisses, drinks, and food. And then we also mentioned electronic cigarette devices. So I initially said avoid e-cigarettes. And then I said, you know, you should just stop using them altogether. Vaping's another talk that I'd happily give. So no e-cigarettes. But you know, folks will tell me all the time that they'll be out like in a restaurant or a bar, and I've even had students tell me this, and they'll share an e-cigarette with a total stranger at a bar. And I'm like, that just sounds gross. You know, I wouldn't, well, hopefully they wouldn't go up to a perfect stranger and kiss them too, but no e-cigarette sharing. You know, when we had mumps on campus, one of the ways tr it was transmitted was uh, through sharing vaping devices. So think about that. Um, get your flu shot. I need to say this at least six more times before our presentation is over. And so 
You know, folks were like, well, if I get the flu shot, is it going to protect me from coronavirus? I'm like, no. But wouldn't that be bad if you got influenza and coronavirus? That wouldn't be such a great thing. And we have a vaccine for influenza. And I still have a hard time selling it. And so get your flu shot. It is not too late. We still see flu all the way pretty much at least through March. So if you haven't gotten one, get one. And um, no one's going to ever win an argument with me about why they're not getting one. So, all right. Um, timeline. Lynn actually found this. We thought it was a really good summary on the timeline for coronavirus and when it started or when it was, you know, first um, identified. And so you can see over the course of this, and we were just talking about a few weeks here, you know, and with each day, the numbers are increasing and increasing. And sometimes we, we find it very hard to difficult how, how Lynn and I kind of find it hard to believe how they can actually calculate all those numbers. And the ranges that we're seeing are so wide. So, you know, it's likely more. And we're going to start hearing about more and more. So, um, anyways, in January 13th, the World Health Organization reported a case in Thailand. And this was the first case outside of mainland China. It did not take long, just a couple of weeks, just a couple of weeks. All right, so as you can see, this is our map. Um, as of February 1st, this is what it looked like. Um, that, the, that statistic in parentheses was as of this morning. So 28 countries and territories have had a, at least one confirmed case of coronavirus. And so as you can see, it's, it's spreading. Again, the numbers are not as much as the flu, but again, we'll go through those numbers. But we, there are starting to identify cases expanding the globe. I think one of the main reasons coronavirus also, you know, obviously scares people is that, you know, we don't have a vaccine for it and we don't have any antivirals for it. And so I think that adds a little bit more fear to folks uh, regarding the specific new virus. So there have been 11 confirmed cases of coronavirus in the United States. Um, this map just kind of has an overview. Six of those cases have been in California, with the other ones scattered through um, Washington, Illinois, uh, Massachusetts, and Arizona. So. Notice Arkansas is not red. No. We do not have a case. We do not have a confirmed case here in our state. And the health department would tell us when we said when we said, okay, so the case was negative and they corrected us. It was never a case, it was a person under investigation. So. It was a PUI, a PUI, yes. So. so the travel ripple effects, and you may be hearing this all over the news, um, multiple airlines have um, stopped travel to and from mainland China. Here's a list of the ones that I could find. So there's over half a dozen of these. Um, Locally here at the U of A, um, we have students and faculty that had planned to travel to China and those trips have been suspended and canceled for now and rightfully so. Um, you'll see on the news that you know, aggressive tactics are, are being done across the country to try to limit the spread of the coronavirus. We have to set limitations and borders to try to see if we can contain these cases. As of Friday afternoon, to the surprise of a lot of health departments across our country, there was a federal order passed down basically restricting um, travel to and from the U.S. to China. It basically initially stated that they were setting up airports in the United States. There are up to 11 airports now that are screening U.S. citizens traveling back from China. The screening involves where they were traveling from specifically, whether it was specifically from Wuhan City, or not, if not specifically from Wuhan City or Hubei, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct, I'm probably not, province, but if they're asymptomatic, no symptoms, they don't have a fever, they're checking temperatures in the airports with a device where they don't actually have to touch the individual, again, trying to minimize contact from one person to the next. If they find that a person traveled outside of that area but from China, with no symptoms and no fever, they're asking that individual to self-isolate for 14 days. 
Remember, the reason for the 14 days is because that's the longest estimated incubation period for coronavirus. Once they've gotten past that 14 days and they've not exhibited any symptoms, they think that individual will be in the clear. Now on the flip side of that, if we have a U.S. citizen traveling from China to the U.S. that's actually traveling, in, or sorry, the first one is if obviously they're symptomatic or they have a fever, they're going to be required to quarantine for 14 days. And it's a federally mandated rule, but still haven't found out a lot of good information of how that quarantine is really gonna work. I actually was just reading articles just before coming over here today, and that's still unclear. The second is if you have folks, whether they're symptomatic or not symptomatic, traveling from Wuhan City or the province, they will automatically be quarantined by the federal government for 14 days and released if they never develop any symptoms. Obviously, as you guys can understand, there's been a lot of controversy regarding this. And on top of that, how's that gonna work? And who's gonna be um, overseeing that? So, um, one of the things I had to throw out is that we need to really be sensitive to our students, faculty, and staff that are from China and perhaps have family members that are sick and ill in China and that are unable to travel back to see them. You know, I pride myself at the U of A. I love being part of the bigger picture and part of this organization, and so I definitely want that message to be heard loud and clear that we're here for those students and that faculty, those faculty members and staff members. Um, I can't imagine the added stress that that would put on someone, so. I have one more thing to add about a ripple effect that it didn't occur to me until I talked to our medical supplier when I needed to order some more masks was guess where a lot of our masks come from. Okay. So, and not only that, when you say, Alexa, where's my stuff? It might not be able to get here right now. <laughs> okay. And uh, I, I was reading that, that there was a Hyundai plant that had suspended operations because they can't get some parts. So it really has an economic ripple effect too, with goods and tourism and all kinds of things. So, so even though we are really at minimal risk right now, it, it's kind of a big deal, okay? Just the fear and, uh, and the impact that it's had. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. I'm going the wrong way. Yeah. I think you're okay. Okay, so we decided to put up just kind of a side-by-side -side comparison between coronavirus and SARS. And so taking a look at the numbers. So I remember SARS, I was living in St. Louis at the time, and I remember folks running around with masks on. And so look at that timeline, right? From November, fall of 2002 to the summer of 2003. A little over 8,000 confirmed cases, 774 deaths, limited to mainland China and Hong Kong. And the death rate at that time was almost 10%. The issues with the SARS outbreak is that it was identified very late. Um, cases had been ongoing for several months prior to it being identified and containment, identification and isolation starting. So now look at our numbers. From early December to today, these are the most updated numbers. So we've had over 20,000 confirmed cases, um, almost 3,000 in critical condition, and over 400 deaths, and now it has expanded to Hong Kong. I think yesterday was the first death in Hong Kong. Hong Kong, for the Philipp Philippines. Well, it's mainland China and Philippines, and then Hong Kong was added. And for, for those of you that are watching on the news as well, you know, Hong Kong is trying to, they're trying to protest and close their borders. And um, I mean, there's a lot, of, a, a lot of political unrest right now in regards to this. And then the death rate currently is about 2%. All right, so let's put everything in perspective. So that's just the basic facts about coronavirus, the science, the clinical symptoms related, the treatment where there really isn't any, and you know, basically our numbers compared to SARS. So let's look at influenza stats, and that's for this season right now, okay? It started in October, the data started collecting then, and it continues. So right now, the CDC estimates 19 million flu illnesses in the United States this season. And we're not done yet, okay? 180,000 
folks hospitalized, 10,000 people have died from the flu, a little over 50 of those have been children, and we have a vaccine. We have an influenza vaccine. And so vaccination is still the best way to prevent influenza infection. And we always say this as well. If you end up getting the flu and you had the flu shot, a lot of times your symptoms will be minimized. The duration of your symptoms will be shorter. And they honestly think as well that maybe you're not as contagious. So it's not being spread as quickly. So. There is no reason, like I said, reasons I hear that people don't want flu shots. I got the flu the last time I got a flu shot. I said, well, that's pretty much impossible because it's a dead virus, so that's not, that's not right. I, I, this is the one I love. I never get the flu. So Lynn and I always say, well, I've never gotten in a car accident, but I'm still wearing my seatbelt. So like I said, you'll never win an argument with us regarding not getting your flu vaccine. Right now in Arkansas, it's actually different because actually when I look, there have been three more reported deaths from flu in Arkansas. So now we're up to 36 in our state. So just keep that in mind. Remember the coronavirus numbers and look at the influenza numbers, okay? That's our last slide. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was hoping the message would come across pretty clear. So, flu shot, flu shots. Thank you so much. That was uh, very informative, very helpful, and I hope again it helps to allay panic, except for you to go out and get your flu shot. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Kelly Hammond. She is Assistant Professor of History here at the University of Arkansas in the J. William Fulbright College of Arts and Sciences. She got her PhD from Georgetown. She is the winner of dozens of grants, most recently finishing a Klug Fellowship at the Library of Congress. She is on the editorial board of the 20th Century China Journal, and she is completing her book manuscript, her copy edits going in. Coming out fall 2020. Coming out in fall 2020 with UNC Press. China's Muslims in Japan's Empire. She is a specialist on the Muslim minorities within China, is also happy to answer questions on that at a, for, at a different time. And she is fluent in English, French, Chinese, and Japanese, and is going to give us a ground level view of what's going on in China. Thank you for that um, very nice introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here today and I'm thankful to um, Trish for this opportunity, Dr. Starks for this opportunity. Um, I'm not gonna speak for very long, I just have sort of three main points that I'd like to make. Um, I think that it's really important when we, you know, we hear China, China, and I think it's really important when we talk about China to disambiguate the people that are citizens of the People's Republic of China from the party state and from the Chinese Communist Party. And I think that we really need to focus in this, in this instance on the sort of disjuncture and how the Communist Party has responded to this and how Chinese people who, whose family members are affected by this crisis have been impacted by this. So the first thing I'd like to say is that I was living in China during the SARS outbreak in 2002 and 2003, and I completely remember the response on the ground. My parents also live in Toronto, which was the second largest epicenter of the SARS outbreak. And so these things sort of are very close in my historical memory. And there are things that really resonate with me when I see um, the fear and the concern of people living in the People's Republic of China. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about the global responses and um, a little bit about the political implications that this could have for the People's Republic of China. So I think that we can all agree that the response from the local authorities in Wuhan has been extremely poor. And the messaging has now been put back on track and the state at the, um, fed not the federal level, at the sort of um, direct level coming from Beijing is very, very on key with their messaging. I think that once this, uh, this epidemic is under control, 
the, the sort of messaging we're gonna hear is, thank God the Chinese Communist Party saved us from this epidemic, and there's gonna be some heads rolling at the local level. We've already seen that happening. But from the very beginning, it seems quite clear that there was some serious mishandling of, these, um, of the situation on the ground. And the reasons for that are uh, numerous, and I can speak to that um, a little bit more in the question and answer period. But this is some of the official propaganda that's now coming out of, um, from the People's Republic of China. This is a timeline, and on the left here we have Hubei province, and it's giving a sort of timeline of what happened, and then um, a, a timeline of what happened in other places, and then the official government response to these incidents on the ground. And so you can see that you know, they've put their propaganda machine in motion, and they're really trying to sort of ensure that the, there is a clear and direct message about how the government is handling this crisis. But, you know, they kind of missed the mark on this. This is um, the, the front page of the People's Daily, the main uh, mouthpiece of the CPC in China. And for the first 20 days of January, there was absolutely no mention on the front page of the newspaper of this virus. And so, you know, some of this has to do with the politics of New Year and the politics of people traveling a lot during the New Year and the desire to not create fear among communities. But I think that there was a really missed opportunity that um, could potentially cause some problems. Another issue that's taking place right now on the ground is that there has been a long-term suppression by the Xi Jinping government of NGOs that are operating in China. This does not specifically have to do with health NGOs. It has to do with um, NGOs that deal with women's issues, NGOs that deal with minority issues, NGOs that help people that have been wrongfully accused of crimes. And they have, have had some serious um, you know, people are having problems getting visas, the NGOs are having problems operating at the local level, and so this is really coming out in the frustrations that I've been hearing from people that work at the Red Cross and the WHO, who are having um, really strong logistical issues on the ground, because they don't have these sort of local networks in place that they would traditionally have if the NGOs had been allowed to operate. And I think this has, this, this, this crackdown on NGOs speaks to some of the, the, the fear a little bit of the current regime um, towards the people that um, could potentially provide different ideas or dissent, um, ideas of dissent. So, you know, we have the suppression of NGOs, but at the same time, we have a live stream of this hotel, this hotel of this hospital that's being built in eight days. You can watch on TV, watch these, ho these hospitals being built. And so, you know, like to me, this is just sort of a distraction. Like, you know, where could these resources be allocated in better ways than, um, you know, this hospital that's being built? And I will say that um, Chinese netizens did not miss that this is a picture from inside the hospital and this, this window has bars on it. Okay, that, that did not go unnoticed, <laughs> and it got high. It was highly, highly criticized. Um, so now to speak to the, the the people that are affected by this, and I think that Chinese citizens who are experiencing this, from what I'm reading on the internet and what I'm seeing on Weibo and what I'm looking at, what I'm seeing is that people are feeling abandoned, and people are very dissatisfied with the government, and. Um, this is a potential of, this has the potential, this is a very potentially a massively destabilizing event for the current regime in China. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So another wrong response to this crisis, I think, is to be completely afraid or to, you know, react in a way that comes across as potentially discriminatory towards Chinese people. We know that viruses are not, can, like viruses don't discriminate, it's people who do. Like this virus doesn't care if you come from a um, Antarctica or from Africa or wherever you come from, it doesn't care. And so these responses from all over the world discriminating against Chinese citizens or people of Asian descent 
not even Chinese descent. In Italy, they're just discriminating against Orientals. Like, it's, it's absolutely crazy. And so I think you really need to sort of think about how you're framing your engagement with the, the discourse that's traveling around about this disease and remind yourself that this is not something we really need to be afraid of and it's definitely impacting people who um, live in China in a direct and important way. So here this is from um, you know, people in Toronto who remember the SARS outbreak. This, the school board had to remind them you know, not to say racist things towards their Chinese neighbors. And the fact that we have to do this in 2020 is absolutely appalling to me. So um, the head of the WHO a number of days ago, actually, or just yesterday, sorry, like these, um, like Huda and Lynn mentioned, these things are just happening so quickly. I also made my PowerPoint at 11.30 this morning and was drawing on news reports from what's going on this morning. You know, the head of the WHO has condemned China, or sorry, condemned the United States for this travel ban and said that we need to use methods that are evidence-based and consistent. We can't just say, no, Chinese nationals can't come in, but American citizens or American citizens with green, or people who don't have green cards can. It doesn't work that way. This is not how we contain viruses. Um, so the last point I'd like to make is that this is a local crisis with global implications. So far, some of the things that have happened are that up to 20,000 flights from mainland to China, to mainland China, have been canceled. I've seen images of flights leaving um, Hubei province. The planes are full, and then they're going back to Hubei and they're empty, so people are fleeing the province if they can. Um, they have announced now an extension of the closure of up to 80% of labor, education, and government facilities in the post-Lunar New Year celebration. So people are supposed to be going back to work um, after sort of what we would consider Christmas holiday, and 80% of these facilities are going to remain closed. All schools in China are closed until, I think, until February 17th, or until later notice. And um, like Lynn mentioned, this is going to have massive implications on the global economy. We are much, China is much more tied in to the global economy than it was in 2002. It was just joining the WTO at that time, and it I think the percentage of its global capital investment has gone up over 17% since 2002. It means, you know, I heard a story about some supplier, some, you know, shower supplier in New Zealand said that he couldn't get the parts to his shower maker in Finland because things were already, you know, being held up in China. So the sort of, the logical, the long-term effects of this are really gonna, um, I think they might be more economic than they are health related. Um, the price of oil is already plummeting and I read an article earlier today about chicken farmers in China slaughtering their flocks because they can't get food to feed their, their flocks. Um, and the Shanghai, Shanghai Composite Index fell 9% on Monday after returning. Okay, so what does this mean for the CCP? Xi Jinping has faced a number of serious, what we would look at as crises to his, to his rule. One of them is the incarceration of over two million Muslims in Western China, and the other one is ongoing protests in Hong Kong that have lasted now for almost eight months. The other one is the sort of the Taiwanese threat that sort of is just like a, poke, a bear in his side that keeps poking him all the time. But these two things do not have the ability to threaten, his, to threaten his rule, I, I believe. Because the majority of mainland Chinese people are complacent and happy with these reforms, or happy with these policies. However, I'm not saying that everyone is, I'm saying that the majority of people are happy and um, obliging in these policies. However, this um, has the potential to really show what I would call the sort of, um, structural injustices that are apparent in China and bring those to the surface in the way that the 2008 Sichuan surge, um, earthquake did and the way that um, other sort of 
large event, large events did. But on a global scale, this really has the potential to hurt his reputation, and we'll have to see whether or not he's infallible as he thinks he is in the future. Um, but you know, people often ask me, like, how long is the Communist Party going to last? And my response is always, until it's not there anymore. And it's things like this, these types of events, that really have the potential to um, throw a wrench in the way that the CCP rules China, or the mainland China. So I'm gonna leave it at that, and um, I would like to thank you for your time, and I will pass it on to the incredible Trish Starks. Thank you so much, Professor Hammond. I feel much more informed now, which is how I end every day anyway. Um, you'll notice those um, papers on the end of your um, aisles. If you are interested in asking a question, and you could go ahead and write those down and send those to the front while I'm talking, I would be happy to then we'll, um, stand at, or sit up here as a panel and be ready to answer questions. Um, me. I am Dr. Trish Starks. I am here a professor at the University of Arkansas in the Department of History. I am a specialist in Russian and Soviet public health with two books on Russian and Soviet public health in the 20th century. And I'm completing another one on the tobacco crisis in Russia during the 20th century. I'm also an author for the American Journal of Public Health and I have uh, received grants from the National in uh, National Institutes of Health and the National Library of Medicine for research into biomedical um, research and biomedical problems. I'm going to keep myself very short today and talk just a little bit about the coronavirus in historical context, looking at first the Spanish flu, the great flu pandemic that was mentioned earlier by Lynn and Huda, quarantines, their history and their effectiveness, and finally, the legacies of disinformation in government and public health, something that Professor Hammond touched upon and something that I can talk about from the Soviet and um, Chinese um, Cuba, or the communist Cuba perspective. The Spanish flu epidemic was indeed a devastating epidemic on a global scale. We're looking at estimates of somewhere between 50 and 100 million dead. And that's a really wide set of estimates right there. But one of the problems is that there was a lot of death within poverty regions that were plagued by poverty, especially India, and that's why we don't have great figures. But about a third of the world's population was affected in some way by the Spanish influenza. It's called the Spanish influenza, but this is one of those instances like Professor Hammond talked about where there was a lot of prejudice that went along with the virus that was not necessarily well apportioned. We think that at the time they thought it came from Spain, but from more recent tracking or shoe leather epidemiology of the virus coming from Kansas, coming from some areas of Europe, it's not as easily apportioned the blame. And that's what historians try to do, is try to give you that perspective in the long haul so that when we have an event like this, we don't immediately fly off the handle and do things like discriminate against every Chinese person or oriental person that we encounter. And so that is what we're trying to do. That's what we try to do in medical humanities. That's what we try to do in medical history. In terms of the Spanish flu as a, a lesson for us today, it is important to remember that things have changed significantly that, since that time. As a result of the Spanish flu, we actually had investigation into creating flu vaccines, the first of which came out in the 1940s and then became readily available and routinely used in the 1950s. This is a modern miracle. This is a drug that we should be availing ourselves of. This is a drug that stops us from having to use other drugs. And therefore, I will reiterate what we have already heard today. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. So get your flu shot. And this will help you out and will help other people out so they cannot get their flu shot. Um, the fatality rate for the flu epidemic, the Spanish flu epidemic, was a little bit higher than what we're seeing with coronavirus. It was about a 2.5%. Again, nowhere near what we saw with SARS. 
And as most of you remember, the SARS is a very contained outbreak. This is something that we should keep in mind. The other lesson that we have from the Spanish flu is to remember that this happened well before antivirals were available, well before antibiotics were available, which are not, a, not useful in this, but might be useful in terms of the comorbid things that we have that come out of the flu virus. So medicine has changed a lot since then. Medicine has become a lot better, and so has prophylaxis. We know how to stop these things. We have common available messages that can help stop these things if we get the message out. Knowledge is power, especially in health. We also have governmental coordination that has come out since then. The World Health Organization, the, after this, um, started to monitor viruses on the international scale. And so after the Spanish flu epidemic, we were able to start talking about governments coordinating. And so as we move into the future from these past events, we can see how we can become better, healthier, and more protected citizens. Now, part of that is understanding that quarantines are not necessarily our most effective method of dealing with viruses. There are some elements of quarantine that can be helpful, but quarantines are a 15th century method that have come into the present. First used against um, ships coming into the ports of Venice, where they would take a ship and hold it off sides, um, offshore for 40 days. It wasn't effective at stopping plague. They didn't know how plague was transferred. Those rats just climbed right on down those um, ropes and went right on into town. So we, we know that that was not effective. What instead quarantine did in those days, and what it still does to a certain effect today, is to ensure panic. Once a quarantine goes into effect, two things happen. People flee if they can. That's why Wuhan, one of the first things that happened is of the 11 million people in the city, five million people left. That's not an effective public health strategy. People flee or they hide their symptoms. Rather than telling people what they're dealing with, they hide their symptoms and therefore become more dangerous to the full. Through protection of themselves and through very understandable reasons. But quarantine is not always our most effective strategy. It can often lead to panic. It can often lead to further problems of virus. Finally, as somebody who, like Professor Hammond, works on an authoritarian regime where all, not always is information well spread to the population, I bring to you the lesson of what happened with the HIV AIDS epidemic in both the Soviet Union in the 1980s and within Cuba in the 1980s and 1990s. In both places, there was not a lot of information coming from the government. What was coming out was misinformation. And then what was happening to people was demonization, shaming, and incarceration. Given those options, we see the same thing happening that we see with quarantine. People go underground, they hide their illness, and it leads to greater spread. Our greatest weapons in public health our greatest weapons against viruses, our greatest weapons as humans, are pieces of knowledge that we share. And that's what this panel has been about, and I'm so glad you've been here tonight. I'm so glad to have had Dr. Huda, Lynn, Dr. Hammond, ooh, my lovely assistant, Dr. Hammond, <laughs> who was gathering the questions. I'm so glad to have had all of you here tonight, and we're gonna start distributing these questions and, among ourselves, and start taking those, and I will read the questions and answer them as they go forward. Um, just to uh, put that also in, effect, in perspective, give you this one nice tidbit. Um, currently in Yekaterinburg, Russia, one in 50 residents has HIV. It's an ongoing legacy of these horrible policies in the 1980s. Yeah, it's, yeah. And one of the problems was because there was no information, they shared needles in the 1980s within a lot of um, neonatal wards. And so they would, there's one case of one city where 75 kids were, 75 babies were infected because of shared needles. So shared information is an important element 
of our, I, I would put up the slide about getting your flu shot again, but I'm going to leave it in there. Um, for uh, my colleagues, will come up here, or are you going to take this first one? I don't, I don't mind taking this first question. Wow. If other, Trish can maybe, or you, do you want to collect other ones? Do you want to collect? I think there's more oh, people yeah, with questions. Collect. So the question is, how exactly does um, the coronavirus threaten the regime of the CCP? And I think the short answer to this question is that it shows people on the ground that there are cracks and holes in the promises that she has made to the citizens that are living in China. It shows that the bureaucracy is not as capable as it claims that it is. And it's really these sort of, these, these events that impact people across class and across um, different socioeconomic uh, socioeconomic sort of standings that are ethnically Han Chinese who live within what we would typically call the heartland of China. When these people start to um, question the authority of the ruling regime, I think it's really, you know, I've seen, I think it's really has the potential to destabilize the power, the, the Chinese government in ways that the crisis, the ongoing crisis in Western China with the Uyghurs, as well as the protests, the ongoing protests in Hong Kong um, do not. And this has to do also with, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. And I can talk more about that if other people would, if people have more questions about it. I have one question here. I, I apologize, I should have mentioned this in our slides as well. It was kind of on our timeline, but what is the source of the 2019 coronavirus? So that has yet to be determined. You know, what they basically said that they thought where it started from was a seafood market in Wuhan City. They thought that that's probably where the first cases came from. But it also became apparent that in that market, there are also other types of live animals that are sold, other things are sold in the market. Right now, the suspicion is that it may be coming from a bat reservoir, but they're not sure about that. They're actually trying to look at the genome of the virus to try to figure out if they can kind of narrow down where the intermediate host came from. And that's part of the problem, is that until that's identified, just kind of like what Kelly was saying, what Kelly and Trish were both saying about, you know, the plague came from rats, it didn't come from people. So until they identified that it was the rats, you know, the spread continued. So the Center for Disease Control is still working on that, as well as the World Health Organization. But there hasn't been anything that's been positively confirmed of where it started. So. Um, so one of this question is, is there a potential political backlash from Beijing to the U.S. for the U.S. travel bans and other quick responses? Again, um, I'm, you know, this is sort of outside of my comfort zone because I'm a historian, so I always like to deal with things that happened in the past, and I don't like to make predictions about the future. Um, but sometimes I'm put in these predicaments where I'm forced to make sort of speculations based on what I've seen in the past. And the short answer to this question is also yes. I think that there will be some um, sort of at least ideological or um, sort of crackdown, not, I don't, crackdown is not the right word. Um, a res, a, a restri maybe some sort of restrictions, economic restrictions in the long term that are meant to not only sort of retaliate, but perhaps hurt U.S. trade relations with other countries as well, so. Okay, this question is, how does the process to create a vaccine for the Wuhan virus occurs? Well, when, you, when you're making a vaccine, you have to culture whatever you're, you're making the vaccine against, right? And it's very difficult to culture viruses. You know, especially the coronavirus. If you guys recall the Ebola outbreak we had where everyone was scared to death about Ebola, but they weren't afraid of the flu. 
it took several <laughs> years um, for them to come up with the vaccine for Ebola, which they are using it right now in the Republic of Congo, who has had an Ebola outbreak since 2018, and over 2,000 people have died of Ebola in that outbreak. It's ongoing. They've had over 4,000 cases, and the vaccine is proving kind of effective when they can get it to the people. So it's not something like, you know, it takes almost a year to make a flu vaccine. They're starting right now on next year's flu vaccine. So it's not something that you say, oh, like, like they do on TV. Oh, we got blood from this sick person and we're gonna, we're gonna make the vaccine and save the world. It takes much, much longer than that. But they have people all over the world working on it because at least the Chinese have shared the, this bug with the world, okay? <laughs> and, the, uh, and the DNA and the genotypes and all of that thing. So they're, they're working on it right now. So one thing I'd like to add to what Lynn said too is, you know, how long have we been working on a vaccine for HIV? I mean, you know yeah. what I'm saying? I mean, so this is, it is a, a very long process. And Lynn and I also would like to say, because we've given this lecture to Dr. Bailey's class, is that there are other infectious disease issues going on across the, uh, across the world. You know, we've seen a massive increase in dengue fever, especially in Brazil and South America. We've had over 6,000 folks die in the Republic of Congo from measles because they don't have access to the vaccine, which we do here in the United States. <laughs> and we had a mumps outbreak on campus last semester. Mumps, yes. I don't want So I just, I, I, just, I just, Lynn and I, you know, we, because of the campus, because of where we work, you know, all international infectious disease issues may affect us at some point because of the students that we serve, the travel that comes on our campus and off of our campus. But there are a lot of other issues that are going on in the world that we're not hearing about. So. Okay. I think we have time for one more. We have two minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So my my last question here is how does censorship play in to play a role in containing and or spreading the virus? Um, I'm going to reframe that question a little bit, and I think that. There's a lot of information and there's a lot of misinformation, um, both in China and in the West. And I have been reading reports coming out of China that the censorship dealing with the, with the um, crisis in Wuhan has been a little bit lenient because the central government is a little concerned that it's going to upset people that are just kind of grieving or letting out some of their frustrations. Now, whether or not that um, actually transpires into um, people being allowed to air their grievances. I'm not, these things are still obviously developing. But I think that censorship definitely plays a role um, in, in, in everyday life for everyone that lives in the People's Republic of China. And I think that um, the, the main point is, is that we as, concerned citizens need to learn how to vet and look at information properly. And so for instance, a couple weeks, or last week there was a picture that was supposedly came out of Wuhan of a woman eating a bat. It was, that was what we would call fake news, okay? <laughs> so I just would urge you guys to like use your common sense and think critically about what you're seeing on the internet and not panic and not freak out and just you know, be thoughtful global citizens and, um, you know, pay attention to what's going on around you. So that's the last thing I have to say. I have one more thing, and it actually was a question, it's a difficult question. Um, so if quarantine isn't effective historically, then what should the U.S. do to safeguard against the spread of the virus instead of the travel bans? So let me just mention a couple of things, because Lynn and I have asked our health department this. They don't know, the CDC doesn't know the answer to this. We asked, they're listing these numbers of recovered individuals. So our question was, well, once infected and developing symptoms, how long is, that illness, how long is the illness gonna last? How long will the person be contagious? Those answers are not known. So if you quarantine someone, and within that 14-day quarantine, they develop symptoms, well, how much longer are we gonna keep those folks in quarantine? So I think with anything, flu season included, is regardless of this quarantine from China, 
I think the more important thing is to early identify, isolate, vaccinate, if available. So early identification, isolation, and vaccination, if available. But there's so many answers, there's so many questions that don't have answers to them right now. But hopefully in the coming weeks and months we'll have more answers. All right, I want to thank you all so much. If we did not get to your question, I'm sure you could come down and ask it at an individual level. I'm so sorry that we ran out of time, but I think it was an invigorating discussion. I'm so very pleased with my fellow panelists and want to thank you all for taking the time to be part of this. And I'm sure that everybody else would like to thank them as well.